in a postdoc stay in Berkeley. And then he got a harmonica hall, but he finally incorporated the EPC in 2013 as a Ikebask research fellow. And so today he's gonna talk about uh, his activities in, in the IPC, focusing on method development and implementation uh, for excited states uh, and also strongly correlated system and show some examples also of uh, collaborations. So please. Okay. Casco Clarina, Esker Casco de Noy, Torsia Gatic. It, uh, bueno, uh, yes, yeah, Claire said, uh, we'll try to give you a taste of the different lines of research that, that we perform here at the DIPC, and everything is, is related with the electronic structure of molecular systems, okay? And, but this is the most important part of the talk, so people involved, so every, the one who really do the work, uh, I only present that, and, and I'm very lucky to share uh, um, our efforts uh, with these very talented and and motivated uh, researchers. So, uh, and we try to do, as I said, different things related with uh, molecular uh, compounds and, uh, and from a theoretical and computational point of view, and mostly related with how is the electronic structure of these molecules. And we develop methods to compute electronic states, both uh, ground and excited states and also uh, transition properties and even excited state dynamics, energy transport, uh, and lately quantum algorithms. That's something that uh, seems that we need to do. Uh, and we have, I like to think that we have a lot of experience uh, dealing with molecular photophysics. So the interaction of light with molecules, uh, which involve the, the transition between electronic states and we, we do, kind of complex processes like singlet fission, triplet triplet annihilation, intersystem crossing, or um, the emission in, in <coughs> radicals, uh, and even photochemistry, which would be something similar, but when we have a, a chemical reaction. And, and another big area of our research is dedicated to what they, <laughs> we could call molecular spins or the, inter the study of systems with one, two, or many electron uh, ampere electrons, um, and their, in particular, their magnetic and op optical properties, and and also uh, the coherence of these spins uh, or the loss of this coherence, and and also potentially if they could be used as materials for quantum computing. So let me, I will I will try to give a taste of these different areas. Um, maybe too many things. Uh, I won't go into the details, but please stop me at any time, okay? Um, so first, um, I will give you uh, the method that we like the most in our group, at least I like the most, that we've been developing for many years, and 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 which is the main part of, of our method development, development. And also at the end of the talk, I will talk about some ideas in quantum algorithms. So, so the, the problem that in quantum chemistry that we have uh, is that um, we need to solve, if we want to solve in the born oppenheimer non-relativistic approximation, this uh, time-independent uh, Rodinger equation, and everyone here knows that, um, it's very complex because we have many, many variables, basically. And although we do have a brute force exact solution, what in quantum chemistry we call the full CI solution, so we cannot, uh, in practice, we cannot use this solution because the, exponent, the cost of this method grows very rapidly with the number of the electrons that we have in the system and the the size of the system in general, um, this number of electron functions. And of course, this is for a classical computer, right? For a quantum computer, this is another story that I will try to go back at the end of the talk. Uh, and so in quantum chemistry, in method development, we do approximations to this thing, right? Uh, I think the, the largest calculations in full CI is with 10 electrons. So the exact full CI. So, so um, Clearly, we, we want to go beyond that. <laughs> and, and the approximations that we do in quantum chemistry, we kind of split them in two different ways. It's how well we describe one electron, and we do that by choosing a basis set. That's what we do in, in quantum chemistry. And then 
The second thing is how we deal with electron-electron interactions. Uh, so this could be the, the electron correlation problem or the in, in DFT, the change correlation functional that I choose, how, how I describe this or how I, I approximate this. So, so uh, we, we don't work in this aspect, in this area. So we basically try to find smart approximations for dealing with this and avoiding this cost. That's what we do. And let me go back to the kind of things that we want to study, not from the method development, but for our applications is molecular spins and excited states or photophysics. And these are the kind of systems that we would like to, to explore. So they are not small molecules, I would like to say. We have many electrons and they are complex, right? So here are open shell systems with many ampere electrons. So the ground state is nearly degenerated with some with uh, different states. And here in these systems, we can have many excited states at the in a small range of energy and with very different character, like local excitations. So here we can have charge transfer, even multi-excitons. So we would like to be to have a method which is cheap, computationally cheap, but is able to deal with all these situations. Um, so as a chemist, um, when we think about the electronic structure, we think about this of a set of molecular orbitals that we fill with alpha and beta electrons, right? So that's the, the general picture, and it works uh, very well for most of the molecules that we call closed shell molecules. Uh, and this is the case of probably the simplest one, which is H2, in which we have uh, two electrons <laughs> in the sigma bonding orbital and none in the sigma antibonding. So this is this particular case, this general picture that at least I have in mind. And, um, and this is true, and this in reality is the mean field solution that uh, is called hartree fock and it's, it works very nice uh, at the equilibrium. It's very close. This solution is very close to the exact one, the full CI. But as soon as we um, dissociate this molecule, the two molecular orbitals become closer and closer in energy. And this picture about the let's fill some low energy levels and let's and leave the others unoccupied does not work anymore because now here we have to decide where, where do I put the, the two electrons, right? So here we need something beyond the hartree fock or the mean field solution. And this is true. And then people say, well, we need a, a multi-reference calculation, right? Yes, I would like to add, we need a multi-reference calculation for this state, right? For this singlet, but because the triplet has no problem. So the triplet can be properly described with mean field in, in, at any distance, right? So in the triplet, we don't break any bond and we always put uh, one electron in each orbital. It doesn't matter the energy gap. So always can be described uh, with one um, um, as, as later determinant, so mean field. So, what we did, we took this, this lesson and we tried to use this to build a, a, a method. And, and the idea is first, okay, let's use our experience as a chemist and let's split, first of all, split the, the orbitals in, in different sets, uh, um, meaning that here I call one, two, and three. And around the Fermi level, I will consider these are the important orbitals and electrons where things will happen, reactions or excitations or whatever. And then I will consider these higher and lower sets of orbitals less important, okay? And then I will go back to these, and from this lesson, I will take the highest spin state within this set of important orbitals, right? Why? Because now I know that for this, in general, for many, for a broad area, this highest spin will be well-defined with only one determinant. So I can use a well-defined mean field solution if I take the highest spin of the important space. So that's the simple idea. But this, um, I will use this just as a starting point of my wave function because now I want to compute many states. And then this will be in a starting point and then I will apply an operator that moves, excites electrons within between these different uh, orbital spaces. And this will allow me to compute different states. And how I do that, I, I allow all possible combinations within this super space of important 
uh, orbitals, which you can call it a, full, a reduced full CI or CAS, a complete active space, if this is the complete set of orbitals. Uh, and then I allow all possible combinations here. And, and then on top of that, I will add what I call particle excitations, which is I move one electron from this important set to the one which is fully empty and whole excitations uh, from the fully occupied to the important set, just to make my wave function even more flexible. Okay, and this is the method that we call restricted active space spin flip. Uh, spin flip because the kind of operator that I take from a high spin to any spin multiplicity. Uh, and, and a restricted active space because I split my orbital space and I make restrictions, okay? So as I said, you can realize that if I do that, this is in a, in a sense, a, what in quantum chemistry is called a CI method, a configuration interaction. So my wave function is a linear combination. At the end of the day, it might look very fancy, but it's a linear combination of determinants. That's what it is, right? But, uh, but what I don't do, I don't. I do not optimize orbitals because I, I'm saying the highest spin orbitals are good orbitals. So I will use this, and I don't have to care about that anymore, right? And then the the CI expansion is a bit particular because it's not is is not done as in single doubles and so on, but in excitations within the important space, whole excitations, particle excitations, and so on, right? Um, this is a different way to organize excitations. And in particular, we like to truncate this uh, because it's computational is much more affordable. Basically, you can see that this is, uh, if this is not very large, so, so this method grows linearly with the number of electrons, basically, and with the number and, and the size of the basis set, the size of this part, right? So it's kind of, the computational cost is not very high. And I don't need, again, I don't need to optimize orbitals. Um, so, uh, and I have a, a systematic way to deal with different levels of correlation, right? So if I have a, a two coupled spins or electrons, so in chemistry would be a diradical, I can use the single spin flip. So one only starting from the triplet, or if I have four or five, then I can use a higher level. And uh, so I have a kind of systematic way to deal with different systems. Of course, I need some chemical knowledge to put in, in my method. method. It's not a black box, but I think it's uh, we can take advantage of this. And because the way that we build this, there is my, sta my, my states at the end of the day, my target states are spin pure. So there is no spin contamination. And so you, you will get non-relativistic chemistry, you will get Spin pure singlets, triplets, or doublets, anything. Okay. Uh, and of course, it's a CI. I can solve this for one root or for multiple roots. And then I can do photophysics as well, right? So I can compute ground and excited the states and, and, and their properties. Okay. And I can say that this, this method is great. And we have been applying this method in many different situations, like in, in large poly radical systems, in uh, and the topology of conical intersections in and fancy uh, molecular photophysics. Okay, that's nice, but but let's go to to the problems, right? Because so you can see the year. So this is in the past. So right now we are trying to to improve the limitations of the method, and and the main limitation that we have is the truncation. So the the, the truncation that we have in our expansion, it's great because it allows a low computational cost, but then we are missing something, right? So that's that's right. Um, so and and what and and the impact of this we can see that in the energy that we compute for, uh, for instance, the ground state. So so this is the HF molecule. This is a closed shell molecule, a simple one. And here the energy exact the the exact energy, non-relativistic energy, and then correlated methods, right? Because it's a closed shell, so all these methods are very close to full CI. But the mean field is up here, right? So it's more than five dB above the absolute energy, electronic energy. So what about our method? So our method for this particular case of a closed shell actually is closer to the for a for a small active space, of course, is is closer to the mean fields, is close to the mean fields solution, right? So so we are not including these terms that are clearly present in these other methods. 
Uh, but and this problem is also you can see this problem also in in excited states because the relative energies that you might compute between the states might be quite off with respect to the good solution. And again, this is this is uh, the, the fact that we are not including these terms, and these terms could now be included either variationally, but then yeah, we can keep including terms, but then the computational uh, cost will explode. We don't want to do this. We can include them as a perturbation, like in multi-reference perturbation theory, and we have done that, and it's nice, but uh, still the computational cost is like, well, like going from CAS SCF to CAS PT2. Yeah, we can do that, and yeah, but but lately we have been trying to to uh, to find a cheapest uh, solution, and and the idea was to let's try to mix uh, wave function our wave function or in general wave function theories with DFT. So what, what is the, the motivation of this? So the, the idea so is that in wave function, we know where the limitations are and how they could be improved, right? So including more terms. And, and it's, a, a, it's a clear and simple strategy to deal with a strong correlation, right? So if we, well, um, uh, 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 Diradical can be treated with two configurations, for instance, right? Uh, so we know how to do that. But in, the, in DFT, this is much more tricky, in, in particular in quantum chemistry, so it's concham DFT. Uh, we should be doing that with the exchange correlation functional, and that's very difficult, this part, <clears throat> right? But then what we call dynamic correlation, so all these contributions that, that are small, but we have many of them, this is we know how to solve this problem in wave, in wave function theory, but the convergence is very slow. So meaning that we need to include many terms and the computational cost is huge. And in, but in DFT it's very simple because the, the short range interactions through the uh, correlation functional mainly uh, are included very efficiently here, right? So we would like to take this with this and make a new method, right? But if you go to the equations, it's not that simple that you add A plus B. We need to do things properly, right? And here we have explored two different ways to do that. And one is deal, dealing with the orbital space. So basically the idea is the, let's just split the orbital sp space and then say, okay, these orbitals for DFT, these orbital for wave function, or the other thing is the uh, interaction. So let's go to the Hamiltonian and in, uh, split the interactions, the electron electron interactions and say, these interactions for DFT and these interactions for wave function. So I won't talk about this case, but let me show you what we have done in this direction. So, um, so these uh, these ideas have been uh, around for a, for a long time, uh, and here the idea is to uh, split the Coulomb operator in the in the in a long range part, so electrons which are separated, and a short range part. And due to the properties of the both the both methods, so let's give this piece the short range to DFT and the long range to the wave function. Right. Um, so if we do that and we work a little bit the, the equations, we, we can end up with this kind of functional. And we have uh, the wave function part in which the here we only have one piece of the electron electron interaction. And here we have the DFT, but now it's the uh, Hartley exchange and correlation functional, but only the short range part. Okay. Uh, then we have to decide okay, what is the shape of this long range um, potential or interaction? Uh, what wave function do I choose here? And, and what is the shape of, of this function? I have to choose these three things. So the first, the first one, it's in the literature, many people use the, F, the error function, uh, and this is the one that we have implemented. And, and if we do that, this, this a splitting of lo long range and short range depends on this parameter. And this parameter, if it goes to infinity, we recover the pristine wave function model. And if it goes to zero, we recover the concham um, energy uh, of the functional that we choose. And, and this is how it looks. So it's, it's long range and short range, but it's not black and white. So the transition is a smooth and, and here, um, so that this would be the total uh, potential and 
this is the short range of, uh, so sorry, this is the long range of this <clears throat> form, and this is the total minus the long range. And, and the parameter, the inverse of the parameter, gives us an idea of where the long range, so wave function starts and where uh, um, the DFT stops. Yeah, and the, the wave function, of course, we want to use a multi configurational wave function, right, in order to, to, to leave a strong correlation to the to the wave function. And in our case, our the method that I just presented before, but it could be any other method. And, and we have also implemented different short range versions of typical LDA and DGA exchange and correlation functions. So no, I, I won't go into the details here. And if we look at, at this expression, this is a state specific. So meaning that this equation, because it depends here in this density, we have to solve it for each state. And this is kind of annoying because in our wave function method, we did just one shot, one calculation, one diagonalization in this subspace, and we obtain several states. But in this equation, we, we cannot do that. So we do an extra approximation and in order to have some sort of effective Hamiltonian. And now <clears throat> if we use this effective Hamiltonian instead of um, <clears throat> this form, we can also compute with one shot the ground and an excited state. So just basically the idea is I, we can compute with this method ground and excited state as well. Yeah. So one example. So polyins is a typical test of uh, Excited the state methods, and and here the two lowest um, um, excited singlet states belong to this ionic excitation from the homo to the lumo, and this called co covalent state, which is mostly the excitation of two electrons from the homo to the lumo. So basically, <clears throat> here you you can see that we need this multi configurational method. So TDDFT used, which is the probably the most common method in, in quantum chemistry for excited states cannot even compute this state, right? Because uh, it's a, a linear linear response, which is the typical implementations in many packages. Uh, so linear response is not able to, to in the adiabatic uh, uh, approximation, it's not able to compute this. So here we take advantage of our wave function that can compute this easily. And now let's see how DFT improves the results or not. So. So if we compute here for the different values of N, so these are the different colors, go from ethene, so two carbons, to butadiene, exadiene, so the number of N increases, right? So the size of the molecule, and here I have the different methods. So, and this is the error with respect to the reference energy, excitation energy for this state. So this is plus spin flip, our previous wave function, only wave function, and, and this is when we mix our wave function with short range, short, short, short range, short range LDA, GGA, and the same thing with GGA, but with a different wave function. And then CASPT2 would, would be a method that is purely wave function with perturbation theory. So we can see that the errors with only wave function are huge, right? 1.5 EBs for excitation en energy error, this is huge. But this is the price that we, in some cases that we have to pay uh, in our method. So, and this is the lack of this correlation. And we can see that with the short range, we recover this. And, it, and it's really the short range, it doesn't matter the wave function if they are the, the same kind. And it's very similar to the CASPT2. So this is amazing, right? Because so basically, going from here to here is for free. The additional computational cost is zero. So, right? So this is great. So, but it's not always like this. So here I'm I'm picking a, a nice example, but that's not always true. So here for the second state, it has a different nature, and now the errors are even worse than before. So we said, okay, we have a method that is great, but maybe. In some cases, it doesn't work. Let's try to fix this, and then we will have a great method, um, right? And then Aaron took this challenge and 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 tried to improve this. And and to improve this, we said, okay, let's go to try to understand this method in in in, in more detail, and let's try to to find where it fails and how we can improve this, right? 
Uh, so instead of going to excitation of these molecules, let's go to the simplest case once again. Let's go to H2, right? So and here is H2 for full CI exact solution and our LY function, which is works very well, right? It should work very well. So what is missing in this case is what we call the, in quantum mechanics dynamical correlation here. So now I want short range correction that should only add slightly short range energy here and nothing here, right? And improve this. This is a simple case. We should do that, right? And this is what we get. So if we add short range DFT along this dissociation, actually the results, well here, let's say they are the same here, but here this, this is terrible, right? So, so now it's not a problem of, well, this is state, no, no, there is a, maybe in some cases we, we are lucky, but it's not. So, so in order to understood that, what we did is we now compute, the, well, we are on computer, the, um, the, this, the energy along the dissociation for our method. So wave function with DFT, short range DF LDA. And now for the ground state, this is the ground state. And here, the triplet state, but we can compute different um, projections of the triplet state. And here we have the MS zero and the MS plus or minus one. So we can see that there is no real, no relativistic effects here. Our Hamiltonian is non-relativistic, so we shouldn't be getting this. So this is so here is the problem, right? So actually, this state it actually goes much as slower, but the singlet goes to the MS zero, which is singlet is also MS zero. So the problem is something about MS, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we said, well. This is spin polarization. In DFT, we include in spin polarization through the spin densities to the difference between the spin alpha and spin beta. But in our wave function, there is in an NM and in an MS zero state, there is no spin polarization. This is only in coin sham. So then we don't in our functionals, we don't have a spin polarization. And we will never have if we our density comes from an MS zero state, even if it's a triplet. So how can we do that? So what we did is we tried to change our functionals, which depend with the, uh, the, de the alpha, so spin up and a speed down densities with other densities. And these densities should reflect the number of unparalleled electrons, not the difference between alpha and beta, but the number of unparalleled electrons, right? Here I have two unparalleled electrons, but I have in each point the same density, alpha and beta. And here I have, non unparalleled electron and also the same point, uh, at, uh, the same density alpha and beta in each point. So I have to account for that. And so then these are not good variables for our methods. So we, we try to transform this in something that uh, accounts for this number of unparalleled electrons or the density of unparalleled electrons at each point in the space, right? And for to do that, the point is that the number of unparalleled electrons this is not an observable, so there is no operator. So we can we can do metrics and we can play with different metrics. And 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 here are different possibilities that depending of the occupation of our natural orbitals, we have a function, different type of functions that put a number of the number of occupation, the number of unparalleled electrons, and we use that, and we will use that to now build these different densities. Okay. And if we do that, yes, we with some how improve the results, um, right? Um, so these are these blue ones, depending on the metrics that we use. Um, this, these energies are much better, but well, the profile, it does not look very nice. Okay, so that, yes, this is the problem, but we don't have a, an excellent solution, I would say. Okay, so, but then if we dig a little bit, we can now, we know that is the spin polarization in the functional. So, but the functional has two parts, correlation and exchange. Let's look at these two parts. So here I'm plotting for the singlet, the straight line, and triplet MS zero and triplet MS plus and minus one, the correlation uh, energy. And there is basically almost no difference. So all the difference come from the exchange, which makes sense, right? So, so the problem is in the spin polarization, but it's manifested in the exchange part. So maybe, 
maybe this is a bit difficult. Let's try to to deal with the change, and and try to 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 get a different form of the exchange. So what one option would be? Let's use pure hard fork exchange. So instead of the DFT whatever exchange, LDA or uh, DGA, let's use exact exchange exchange, and that's one option. And the other would be let's try to use the wave function exchange. So basically a weight, so some sort of mathematical trick to reabsorb a change into the wave function part and here only leave correlation. Okay, so we consider these two these two options. And if we do that, so here are, are the, the results. And here, okay, so black is the exact solution. It's here, right? So um, now, I put um, all the all the profiles go to to zero. Okay, so this is our initial short range uh, solution, which is far away from the black one. We know that this is wrong, and we know this for polarization in new change. If we do, if we use the this exact change from Hartree Fock, it's even worse, right? So this is pristine wave function, which was already very close. And this is the polarization that has this problem here. And then if we use the wave function exchange or only correlation, this is the one that gets closer. So in all this, at the end of the day, it's like, okay, let's let's just leave wave function to the, take care of a change and just give correlation to the DFT because otherwise it's too complicated. Um, and here, uh, that's what we think is the best in this line of research is the best option. And here, I'm, let me show you an example of computing single triple gaps in these di radicals, um, uh, benzene, or, ortho, meta, and, and para. And, and I will be showing you the results uh, uh, for the wave function, wave function with short range DFT exchange and correlation, and only correlation, right? And here are the results. Yeah. Oh, and in, in the only part correlation, this can be solved self consistently or uh, or in only one shot and uh, this would be like going from gw to gw not so, but it, it would be equivalent approximation okay and this is the single triplet gaps for these uh, molecules with this basis set and you can see that uh, this is pristine wave function this is complete short range dft we have this huge overestimation and we have this huge overestimation because we the open shell state we compute it very wrongly because the spin polarization problem but now uh, we can see that uh, the the solutions that only when we only include correlation dft correlation the, the results are very close to to the experimental ones so we believe that uh Although there are several works in the literature that use this sort of approximation, exchange should be put into the wave function and correlation to DFT. So that's our our take home message in this case. <coughs> okay, so this was uh, one of the our latest uh, improvements, or I think it's an improvement in wave function. Let me talk about a little bit about uh, molecular photophysics, and I will show you uh, two examples. One is anti-cache emission. So now we're moving something very different and <clears throat> photochemistry. So not exactly photophysics, but it should be in this, in this line. Okay, so for the ones who don't know, so in molecules and in particular in what Kasha did in molecular or explaining for molecular chromophores is that typical molecules tend to emit light uh, independently if you excite to a lower state or to a higher state from from the lowest excited singlet. So fluorescence is from S1. Why? Because this process is, is very fast. So even if higher states can emit, uh, the system relaxes non-radiatively through internal conversion to the lowest state. And then from here, it emits. And basically the idea is that internal conversion, the, the, the rate of internal conversion is inversely proportional to this gap. So, so small gaps, internal conversion is very fast, right? So, so these gaps tend to, in, in organic chromophores, these gaps tend to be small, and the gap between S0 and S1 tends to be much larger. 
So this is this is fast, and then from here it emits. And of course, there are some molecules that do not um, follow this rule, and these are exceptions, and they are called anti-Kasha. So systems that we know that there is an S1 state, but but tend to emit from a higher a higher uh, uh, singlet, typically S2. Okay. Um, so and there is a lot of work in this direction, mostly fundamental, but also there are some possible applications. Uh, and what we did, or what we did with ITOR, is we tried to propose a new design principle to improve anti cache emission in molecular systems. And the idea is, is very simple. The idea is to let's couple two of these emitters, uh, which are already anti cache but let's couple in, a, in, in this way. Um, let's, let's try to make the coupling between the two S1s very weak, and then the coupling between the two S2 weak, but the J type, meaning that the brightest state will be the lowest. And then if we preserve this gap is large, we can still have low, um, um, a slow internal conversion. But and now we, our state will be brighter because if they are coupled as a J aggregate, it will become brighter. So it will be more emissive. So the idea is to have, in principle, dimers that are able to emit from S3, right? In the dimer, this is the one, two, three that come from the interaction of two S2s. So that was a, a very simple idea. And it's different because in the literature, you can find uh, anti cash emission from edge aggregates, so the other way around, OK? And so what are the what what do we need for this? So we need, first of all, symmetric dimers because um, because we not we want this kind of interaction. So basically, we want our exciton to be delocalized, and we want, of course, J coupling between S two and this this uh, inefficient S one interaction to maintain this gap large, and also something that is not in this scheme, but we want to ensure that non-radiative processes are not favorable, meaning that if we, if we enforce some rigidity of the molecule, we will block vibrations that can trigger non-radiative decay, OK? Uh, and to do that, we start playing with azulin, uh, which is a, like the typical um, um, a non cache meter that you can find everywhere, and you can find even in some mushrooms. Uh, so first of all, we decided to, so the idea is to use covalent dimers, uh, and because they need to be symmetric, we can consider different options. So these are the ones that are symmetric, right? So, uh, and then if we go to the electron, the molecular orbitals, we realize that uh, the only arrangement that follows this scheme is what we call B or uh, B um, azulin one, which is meaning that we bind the two azulins uh, in position one. And this is because we have a very small gap between LUMO and LUMO plus one, which will be related with um, um, with these two, um, with this interaction, and a small gap between um, um, between this, these two states. Um, and a disposition of the molecules that we should expect uh, um, uh, J aggregation. OK, so we have decided the, the, the dimer, uh, but now we have to, to check these this, this points. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. And we also have checked these things, right? So within this orbital. So this is the only one that follows this um, pattern. OK, now we consider different ways to um, force the disposition between the two azulines and to block or to make the structure the structure more rigid. And to do that, we consider these four possibilities, meaning that going from one simple bond to these uh, two seven member rings, uh, or even then adding more and more number of benzene rings symmetrically at each side. So if we do that and we look at the orbitals, we see that only, and, and we can understand why, only this 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 uh, structure is the one that preserves the molecular orbitals of the 
dimer that follows the, the, the scheme that we want. And so we decide to keep going with this. And we now, if we go beyond the molecular orbitals, if we compute the excited states, indeed we see that S3 is right and the gap between S2 and S and S3 is fairly large, right? So it seems a good candidate. And, and our colleagues in, in Hong Kong, they prepared a derivative of this molecule. Basically, it's the same thing with these two uh, fragments. And, and if we compute the, the excited states, they preserve the, the same thing, the same structure as in the model. And, and experimentally, it seems that indeed it emits as an anti cache right? So we have, we see here in, in red, this is emission, and this is a high energy emission, which is at higher energies than the absorption, the, the onset, right? So it clearly seems a, an anti, an anti cache And so this emission, you can see this, it's weak, but still it's, it's an anti cache emitter. Okay, so, so yeah. So let me move to to another thing. So this is uh, something about related about photochemistry. So, and and here we got uh, interested in this process, uh, which is called single crystal monomer to single crystal polymer. So the idea is that this process involves going from a molecular crystal to a crystal that preserves the uh, uh, crystal structure, but now. Uh, it forms a polymer between the initial molecules. So the crystal structure basically remains the same, but now the molecules, the molecule, the molecules are covalently bonded. And, and, and we studied this a specific situation for these uh, derivatives of these bees uh, in DIN, uh, in which with light they polymerize, but the crystal remains in the same structure. Uh, and with temperature, we can go back to the crystal, uh, the molecular crystal, right? And, and on top of that, depending on the group that we put here or they put here, uh, this process can be possible or not. And basically it's because depending on this group, we have different separation between molecules and then it becomes, so here, for instance, it does not occur polymerization because the separation is 6.6 uh, 6, 6 Armstrong, so quite large, while in other situations it's much shorter and then we can see polarization, right? So here is the crystal, the molecular crystal, and here is the polymer. Right? So we wanted to understand what is the mechanism going from here, this photo-induced mechanism from here to here. Um, so first of all, we started for the molecule and the idea is that uh, when we excite these molecules, even in, in solution, we produce this excited state that, that if we plot the Lewis structures, that it should be a, a di-radical. Right? And, and this, if we do calculations, this is a homo to lumo transition, no, no problem here. And experimentally, uh, actually in solution, they, they see uh, an EPR signal. So basically this system after excitation <coughs> produces triplets very efficiently. Right, uh, and and this is so. We said, well, we need to compute the triplet as well. So here is is the triplet, which is basically so. This is the spin density that corresponds again to the homo to lumo. So S one and T one look very similar. Uh, so Claire uh, took the challenge and and first studied the system at the molecular level and and to compute the S one and then trying to understand how S one goes to and forms the triplet, which it's what we see what people see experimentally. And, and then uh, she characterized this inter-system crossing from the singlet, singlet to the triplet manifold. And actually, uh, we understood that most probably the, this process is, goes from S1 to T2 because it's the one which is closer, closer in energy and it has a high uh, spin orbit coupling for, for organic compounds. Uh, and then in solution, this is the case uh, with no emission, right? But now what in the, in the crystal? In the crystal, we should uh, expect the same, the similar process maybe because this is something fast, but then we need to, but then, but then we need to form, or we see that bonds are formed, right? Uh, so to model this situation, we took, uh, we explore what happens uh, uh, with a, a dimer as a model, right? Mm, and this is what Claire found, so and which is very cool, I think, because 
in in the in the dimer, which represents the, the molecular crystal, um, we excite one molecule to S1 and we produce the triplet, right? And then with the triplet, um, Claire found uh, that there is a barrier to reach some transition state, which is a triplet, but now it's delocalized uh, and we call the excimer. And this is possible if the distance between the two molecules is uh, small enough. Uh, so in some crystals will be possible, in others not. Uh, and then, and then this is this energy cost. We, you can understand this as the way to delocalize this spin density, right? In, here we have ground state and triplet, and this is energetically better than having to share the the triplet. So this is this energy cost, and then there is a, an energy gain which is forming this bond, which corresponds to polar polarization. Right, so so we understand this, and we also understand uh, and and, the, and 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 this barrier is in agreement with the temperature the dependence of the Raman spectra that the experimentalists see. Okay, so this is two examples of photophysics, and, and now let me go to to a couple of examples of of molecular spins, and and for that I will make use of some our some of our developments in, in computation of transition properties. Okay, so, so as you can, as you have seen just, just in the last example, uh, spin orbit couplings allows us to mix states with different spins, so introducing relativistic effects. And, and this is, as we have seen, this is, might be very important in molecular photophysics, so we want to be able to, to compute the spin orbit couplings. But also, it can be important if we are interested in, in the magnetic properties of molecules, because spin orbit coupling might be very important in, in, in the Zeeman interaction, but also in the zero field splitting. OK, so let me explain you the work of Abel, who did implement, or we did implement, a spin orbit coupling for our wave function, the one that I explained you at the beginning. And, and we did that using this Brad Pauli um, um, Hamiltonian, uh, in which we have one electron term here, right? And, and then a second term, which is depends on two electrons. So basically, the idea of the spin orbit, as the name says, is the interaction of an electron spin with an, an orbit of, of one electron. So here, what kind of interactions do we have here? So in this first term, we can see what is moving is I, this is an electron. So this is the orbit of one electron, which interacts with the spin of the same electron, right? So it's I and I, so this is the spin. So each electron interacts with the orbit one of one electron, interacts with each spin and here, but the orbit in the field of one nuclear, one nucleus, okay? So this is the orbit of electron I uh, in the field of, one atom uh, interacting with each each uh, uh, spin, and in the two electron case we have something similar, but now it's the orbit of electron i in in the presence in the field of the second electron, and now this orbit interacts either with its spin or with the spin of the second electron. So that's why we have two terms. That's why we have all these things. And in general, in quantum, especially in quantum chemistry codes, uh, this is not implemented because it's a two electron term and it's more computationally costly and so on. So typically we see this, this part, which is fine in which is fine in general in in heavy elements, because in heavy elements this term will grow very fast and it becomes much important. But in inorganic molecules, the ones that I show, this can be important. Okay. And another thing is that if you you can see that they have this is they have a different sign. So they can cancel partially cancel each other, right? So so we wanted to implement both both terms and we did that. And of course I won't go into the details, but but the idea, but the, I want to have you uh, a general idea of what, what we have. And what we can do with our implementation, and, and the idea is that we want to compute a spin orbit interactions between two different electronic states with two different spins, maybe, and two different spin projections. The whole thing, not one and one, the whole thing, 
And we don't want to compute every of these states and micro states and do then the, the cap. We want to do that at once, if possible. And how we do that, so first of all, well, here is this, this the, the working equation that we have, and this is a, what we call a transition density matrix, and a, the one particle and the two particle transition density matrix between the, our two interacting states. Yes. And then we do a mean field approximation, not for the method, not for the, the, the wave function, but for this, this part here. And we use what is called the Wigner Eckert, Eckert theorem. And we define this, this special density matrix, which is the, basically the difference between the alpha alpha and beta beta transition density matrix. But the end of the day is that we have this equation that we have some terms, these matrices here, which are integrals between orbitals, right? Which depend on L, right? And then this density, this transition density, right? Which depends only about orbitals. So all the information in this equation between the spin state and the spin projection is in these coefficients. Right, and these are the cleft Gordon coefficients. So, actually, if we know these integrals and we are able to compute this for one specific spin projection, we can compute the spin orbit couplings between all of them, because we only need to change these coefficients that we have tables for these coefficients. Right. So, that's the the, the main idea. Uh, so let me show you uh, an example of the application of this for for closure open open shell systems. And to do that, I will show you the the value which is uh, uh, an scale which is constant, which is the spin orbit uh, coupling constant, which is uh, basically taking the the contributions for all the different projections along this torsion. So this is like breaking a bond, but in this case, a pi bond, and, and would be like looking at the closed shell system and open shell system. And let's see if we are able to compute the spin orbit couplings for this. Um, and in this case, before showing you the results, let me show you what we should expect. So here I will be computing the coupling between <coughs> the ground state uh, singlet and the first excited state triplet, okay? and the ground state singlet and the closed shell in the planar situation will be two electrons in the homo, right? But along the distortion, we will have some mixing with this con with this uh, configuration. Okay, so the singlet in general along this torsion can be expressed like this, like a com linear combination of these two terms. And the triplet is always homo lumo two alpha electrons if we take the ns one, right? So if we com so the, in general, the spin orbit coupling will be something which is like a product of this a difference between these coefficients and the, the integral, the spin orbit integral between the homo and the loom so in, a, in a first order approximation. And this is the, the results that we have, right? We can see that the results are a combination of the homo lumo interaction and this, and and, and this uh, difference of coefficients, which is related with the uh, correlation, right? This is the part that brings correlation to the system that increases along the, the way. Um, so if we take TDDFT and CIS and we do the same calculations, we will obtain always something which is proportional to this. So we will obtain this solution, which is completely wrong. It should be zero at here, right? So if we add correlation as in our wave function, we obtain this profile that goes that the maximum is in between and we have a zero and zero at extreme. So this is the right solution. And also here I'm showing you the one electron part and the two electron parts in a, an organic molecule and see how different the values are if we co not consider the two electron part, which cancels partially the, the one electron part. So that's basically what I said. Okay, so so now we have we have a spin orbit coupling, which will be a, a very important element for us to compute uh, magnetic properties uh, that come from relativistic effects either in the, it's time. Well, 
you uh -huh. might want to speed up a bit uh, to not have people there. It's like sorry, it's one. Okay, so let me <laughs> so let me let me finish with with this. Uh, so so Antonio uh, has been working using the what we have with the spin orbit coupling to to um, compute these magnetic properties in uh, Zeeman effect and, and zero field splitting is, is something that we have in mind uh, for molecular systems and 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 to do that the idea is to map the Zeeman interaction which we have the spin Zeeman and orbital Zeeman and here we have also uh, spin orbit coupling that's what I, I showed with the spin typical spin Hamiltonian, our model Hamiltonian, and and extract these these g g factors that from calculations of these terms, and and to do that, Antonio has a, a nice program that takes the electronic Hamiltonian, which he uses our wave function, computes uh, ground and, and several excited states, and then expands this to an effective Hamiltonian where we where we include the spin orbit coupling. Uh, and and this is just an example of taking uh, a ground state doublet and three excited state uh, doublets as well. And with one calculation, we have all excited states, and we don't and and we have all the couplings between plus and minus, so ms uh, one half and minus one half. And this is the kind of Hamiltonian that that he has. Uh, he computes this, uh, the expectation values or transition values of L and S operators and, and considering the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian is able to build the G matrix. And basically what he reports is the difference between the G matrix and the, the G values for the free electron. Um, so let me just finish by showing you one example. Uh, which is this non-trivial, this, this uh, transition metal complex, uh, COVAL, with this organic ligand. This is highly symmetric. And, and the ground state is a doublet with a, an ampere electron on this dyz orbital. This is the spin density of this. And these are the, the results. And the results are similar to other uh, highly correlated methods, which are more expensive. And in some cases are kind of close to the experiment and some others not, not so much or not enough. And, and we know why. And, and we, moreover, the, the Antonio has a very nice and clever way to analyze and, write, and understand the, the magnitude and, and, and the, the nature of these couplings or the G matrix um, through this perturbation approach. And we can relate these values with the, like the strengths of the spin orbit coupling, this uh, um, the interaction be through the L operator between the ground state and the excited states and, and the energy gaps. And, and this with symmetry, we can explain why these are, for instance, in this case, in the X direction, the values are much higher than the, in these directions and why in some cases they are positive and why in some cases they are negative. So, and with that, I think, I should finish. So I will skip my. Oh, I so. Depends on the audience. No, no, no. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, if there are any questions about the study that's been shown, when I study, uh, we could lose the cross section in one way. <laughs> and I'm sorry. Yeah. No, 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 this is very interesting. So, which is the other magnitude of spin orbit coupling in all these lines? Uh, the magnitude in, in order, in order, so here is very different, you see. So here in transition metals, right? Especially if you have a spin density on the metal, and here because this excited state also has a spin density on the metal, this is uh, well, here we don't see the spin orbit couplings, we see the G factors, right? Yeah. But in organic molecules, uh, that is the, the ones that we have studied the most, they are in the order of centimeters to the minus one. Okay. So so in many papers, in for instance, when they study transition between singlets and triplets in organic molecules, they see one centimeter to the minus one and say this is large, right? For transition metals, this would be yeah. very small. Or, yeah. Very good. I mean, I know numbers estimated uh, proposed by for graphene, and it's even less. So. Exactly. Well, in graphene plus symmetry for spin orbit coupling is is very important, right? So we see that here. 
and it's something which is flat. So now you have a lot of symmetry. So many interactions are not possible there. And we are computing the spinalic couplings for graphene like or nanographenes. Uh, we have some numbers. Yeah. And they are small. So you have rather complicated situations, uh, rather complicated <laughs> molecules, and sensitive quantities. My question, do you have any uh, parameters adjustable, or what is your main approximation somewhere? What is sensitive here? I wouldn't believe if you will say, without any approximation, we just get, or without, without any help to our population, we get sensitive quantities for big molecules. Yeah. Um, so, um, in our methods, we have many, many limitations. We don't have many parameters. So parameters, we we come from something. We try to avoid parameters. So in some cases, for instance, when I use DFT, we have one parameter there that it's the one that tunes where long range and short range start. <clears throat> that this is one parameter. The rest is there are no parameters, but so you mean but you still, take some potential from somewhere and just uh, with split the part of the space, which uh, is yeah, point. in that method, yes. But then, in any case, we don't have parameters, but we we, we do huge approximations, and then I show you, uh, we got, we have seen that how this impacts in our, the quality of, for instance, our energies, and in some cases we have important errors, right? So we do everything that we need to, but then we truncate, and then we, in some cases, we can have large errors. We understand the errors, so we try to put that. So in general, in all these methods, we we cut things, but we don't use the, so many parameters. So for instance, in a spin orbit coupling, we do this mean field approximation that I did not explain. No parameter there, but it's an approximation. Still a good one, I think. So you change the method somewhat, but don't use parameters. In general, no, we don't. In general, not here. Uh, in the next example, there are more parameters, but I, I won't show you that because Claire. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you can show your slide if you want. No, no, no. <laughs> Okay, well, if there uh, are no more questions, well, let's thank David and Hey, David, can you show the next slide? Can I ask you about Yes, sorry, I forget to say the pinch house outside for those who want to Without the leak. Oh, no, 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 it's yeah, 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 
Okay. I miss okay. many things. Show me. Uh, I'm, I'm I, also... I wanted to watch this. No way. Really? Oh no! You're kidding me. Even on his work. Many things. You that, that you. Ah, oh, well, close to the thank you. I mean, I really tried to make a visual contact I'm... at forty five, but you didn't what is that? contact then, with when me. I, when I talk, then I. Keep... I know. I go to more details. More yeah, details. I know. No, no, don't say that. <laughs> I mean, because I know like the things you show, I was just like, why do you say this? No, skip, skip. But I know how you are, so it was like no. Mm. But, but honestly, the time passed fast, fast, even for me. Usually, I get... yeah, no. I mean, the only yeah. problem is I thought at one I have to stop because some people might have uh, no. yeah, yeah. Thank you, yeah, yeah. And I meetings have... and stuff, and I thought if someone has a question, to of have course. the opportunity of and. Course. Course, course. I really went to the last, uh, it was like 50 seconds. Last okay, exactly. I have to stand up now. <laughs> because when you started to say, oh, now I'm going to talk about molecular spins, I was like, oh, I have to uh, tell him, but this is going to be complicated. Yeah. And, uh, well, nice talk, David. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Oops, someone took a piece. Ah, okay. Oui, non? Ah, oui, <laughs> I do the same thing. Oh, I'm, I'm terrible. The point is, I, 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 I mean, I felt it coming, but I was not expecting at this scale. I was like, no way. The point is, I don't do this. I don't, I don't prepare. Talks, I know. And then it happens. That's what happens. I should prepare the talks. Then I have no idea. How yeah, because you just go. No, I think actually it's just, I think on the. Um, Aaron's part, you spent a lot. I like yeah. you finished that because it was the first thing. Yeah, I know, but you finished it. It was almost like thirty-five minutes talk, and I was like, "Oof, that's gonna be complicated." But okay, let's see how it does. Maybe it's gonna go fast. And uh, but, but uh, no. yeah, it's uh, well. But then, if you have to give a talk like similar like this about activities, now you know. I mean, you know what to uh, trim a bit because in the end, it's like. It's removing slides because if the slides yeah. are there, you cannot go short. So you have to remove the slides, basically. Let's go this way. Intro. Yeah. Or oh, whatever. Apple. I'm sorry. I know. Oh. I don't know. Just like it. So uh, I was really thinking how to do this. But I'm just going to say, you know, like, we need to take one of us. We're just going to do this. No.
Thank uh-huh. you. 